Um, it's nice, I thought everybody was gonna be here just to see you, but seeing that they're all still sitting in their seats right now, it's probably a good thing for the rest of the day for us as well. And so, um, yeah, you know, like, uh, like Mike said, it's, uh, it's a great day to be here at, at K-State. And um, another good swine day, like you see up on the screen right here, about 38 papers and a little over 36,000 pigs we'll be talking about today. And so uh, you can look at the agenda and do your math too that uh, in the two hour block, it only leaves uh, a few minutes to actually cover each one of the trials. And so uh, we're moving through pretty fast, but just make sure that you remember that uh, if we have the list of the abstract books out there uh, that you can, you can reference, but also all the, the full reports are online right now. I think and maybe one of the slides Joel will have will have the, uh, the web address. You can go and access all the full reports when you get home and uh, see all the, all the details right there. And so what I'm going to do today is, is kick off the show with uh, the swine, with the sow portion of the study. If we can uh, get the slides going on, where's the thing plugged in? All right, Joel might be my uh, secretary for today. So <laughs> that's not different. That's not. Than it's exactly right. So we're gonna we're gonna touch on some of the sow work that we've done. It's still not working, Joel. So we're gonna start on some of the sow work that we've done here at K State, and uh, what we've done. Thanks, Joel. So if you remember last year, Bob gave a talk about uh, some of the gestating uh, lysine requirement titration work that we did that Lori Thomas did, and so. Because of all the amount of data that we had collected in, in that particular study, we were able to go forward and do some modeling uh, uh, studies here, exercises during the year. And I just want to start here to refresh us on that trial. And so we titrated uh, four different levels of lysine, 11 to 18 and a half grams per day. And then, uh, yeah, and so this was through all of gestation. And then uh, carried the animals then through gestation into lactation right here and looked at uh, wean and performance or, or fair and performance. But what you see in this slide right here is the modeled uh, estimated maintenance energy requirements of these sows. And so you see, as you'd expect, as we increase uh, it, along gestation, uh, we do see an increase in the maintenance energy requirements as those animals are getting bigger. But you'll also notice in the far right hand side right there that uh, as we got to the, the latter portion of the, the study, those sows that were fed the highest level of lysine also were bigger, and so it led to an increase in, in, uh, in maintenance energy requirements. What that means then is as you look at these sows, so we were all fed the same amount of feed throughout the everyday of gestation. As we increased maintenance energy requirements, we actually had a reduction over the course of gestation in the amount of lipid that was deposited. And you can see that as the, the, the slopes of the, the gilts and the sow lines uh, decreasing as you go from left to right. But what is important to see right here though and notice is that everything above that line of zero means that lipid was still being deposited. Right? And so you end up actually still having a positive accretion all the way through somewhere uh, further than ni day 90 of gestation. So it really shows an, uh, an example of animals being able to be in a positive uh, curve from a, a lipid deposition standpoint uh, through the course of gestation with a steady uh, state of, uh, of feed. And so one thing you can see though here at past day 90, you start to see a, a reduction in lipid deposition. Uh, this might lead you to believe that maybe we should be feeding animals a little bit differently prior to going in the Farron house. And that's something we'll talk about in my, sec in my second trial as we, uh, we hit on that as well. Switching from lipid over to protein deposition right now, when you look at protein deposition, this is the, fu this is the foundation for uh, the lysine modeling work that we did. And so, um, as you can see right here, and as you probably know, um, whole body protein deposition is the accumulation of that that's happening with the maternal side from the sow as well as the, the increase in conceptus, which then leads, when you start looking at lysine requirements for protein deposition, an increasing amount as you go uh, forward through gestation, a lot of that at the end being a result of the increase in the conceptus uh, needs. The important thing right here, if you look at that, so all the way through day 70 or 80, really less than eight grams per day of SID lysine is required to be able to meet the sow's needs. And so putting that in reflection of the different trial or the different treatments that we actually fed in this study, Here's the, the 11 to 18 and a half grams, the black up to the purple right here. You'll notice that this is SID lysine balance. So everything positive, everything above the line means that there is more uh, lysine intake than what was required for the animal. 
we're at a positive lysine balance all the way through to approximately day 100, um, with the exception of uh, after that, only the low uh, treatment being fed. And so to put this in perspective, uh, 11 grams per day in this farm was roughly a 0.56 SID lysine formulation. It's about a 0.66 in the 13 and a half grams. And so uh, here's the gilts. I'll sl flip the slide and here's the sows. In essence, uh, all the trials uh, were fed uh, diet, or all the sows were fed diets in the highest three treatments that met their, their SI, or SID lysine requirements from a positive balance perspective. And so I think that gives a pretty good uh, understanding of why a lot of people are probably formulating diets in that 0.56 to 0.66 type of a range uh, when they're putting together gestation diets. Going to move forward right now to uh, some of the transition sow work that we've done. And when we start talking about transition sows, uh, we're kind of defining that as the, the, uh, the time prior to Farron, uh, maybe the last week, last 10 days right here. This is a study that we did uh, up with the Minnesota Port Board. Um, we highlighted this, uh, this study last year in Swine Day, but it's just uh, had gotten finished at that point, and so it's actually in this year's Swine Day edition. In this study, we, have, we fed high levels of energy and SID lysine. Uh, from about day 107, or starting at roughly day 113, or when the, the sows were moved into the Farron house, or we fed a control diet, a lower level right there. And, and the reason that we did this study is that there's some modeling work that was done out of Denmark that suggested that the sow's requirement for energy and amino acids is actually substantially increased uh, from about day 107. And these, these levels of 13.3 megacals and 40 grams per day would meet the needs associated with that Denmark model and study. When we go through and look at the performance right here, this is body weight gain of gilts on the left and sows on the right. We definitely see an, an increase in weight gain of these sows as we increase additional uh, feed. This was attributed, uh, or this was uh, formed by increase of feeding higher levels of the, the lactation diet that we had from either uh, day 113 or day 107. So just to put it in perspective, this 107 is when it started, so it was roughly uh, eight days or so, nine days before they farrowed. In addition to the increase in body weight gain we saw on the sows, we also saw an increase in back fat. And so this is uh, something to keep in perspective as well, too. Even the control diets had a, a back fat gain. And so it's a reflection of the, the body condition of these sows that we're going into the study. And I think maybe that will lay into a little bit of some of the, the future results we'll see as we poke through. We did happen to see an increase in piglet birth weight for the gilts that were fed increased levels of lysine and energy prior to uh, farrowing. Uh, did not see anything from the sow perspective, though. And this would be very similar to some of the work that Marcio Gonsalves reported uh, about four or five years ago when he was looking at increased lysine and energy, where he did see some benefits in the gilts, but no, uh, no benefits from the sows. And again, this could be a reflection in this herd of, of maybe the sows being a little bit on the, the positive side from a body condition basis right here. But again, no, no significant value uh, from the sows. We did not see any uh, change in colostrum yield. Back to the Denmark uh, studies, they think this additional energy and additional protein is important for increasing colostrum quality and colostrum yield. Did not see any difference by, uh, by changing the amount of energy in, in lysine fed prior to farrowing. However, what was interesting, even though we saw an increase in piglet body weight, we actually saw a reduction in uh, litter gain throughout the lactation period in the gilts. Uh, no change in sows right here, but this is definitely something that, that, that we need to be mindful of. Unfortunately, in this study, we didn't have the opportunity uh, to measure feed intake on these sows, and so potentially this is a reflection of lower lactational average daily feed intakes uh, from the sow, reducing milk uh, production, potentially then reducing litter weight gain right here. But uh, just speculation right now, but definitely something that we need to be thinking about as, as we're looking at increased energy, increased lysine potentially prior to farrowing, especially in, in gilts. The other thing, though, that we need to keep in mind is the actual cost of what it, it took to be able to get this trial done. And so this is a study that looks like the additional feed cost per weaned pig. And so um, the big thing right here is that I, I think it's, it's not a surprise that we feed more feed. We fight, feed a higher nutrient-dense diet. It's going to be associated with an additional feed cost. But also we need to keep in mind that, you know, this is basically, day 107 is basically a week of additional feed. You know, the, the, the day 113 was two or three days of additional feed right here it's a big impact on your bottom line right there. And so we can't go back and say we're going to change a strategy and just do it for a week. It's not going to really impact that much. Reality was that uh, the, this treatment doubled uh, the extra feed cost per weaned pig uh, when we fed it for too long. And so you need to be mindful of the cost of any of these strategies that we're trying to imply in the farm. Also had the opportunity to do another uh, transition sow study that we actually did this summertime. And, and this was the very first study that was part of uh, this, this big pig survivability project. It was a grant from National Port Forward and, and FR. Uh, Joel and Mike and myself are, are, 
are part of this group that's associated also with Iowa State and, and uh, some researchers from Purdue. Um, this was the very first uh, sow study looking at improving piglet survivability. Joel's going to talk a little bit more about that in his slides. But in this study, uh, there's been some work coming out of Denmark also that they say that the time from offering the last meal prior to farrowing to uh, the, the time when she starts to farrow has an impact on colostrum yield or colostrum quality, but more importantly, uh, stillbirths. And so if we feed sows one meal a day at 7 o'clock in the morning, Bob, and she doesn't start farrowing until 8 o'clock that night, she's already gone that many hours without having any energy coming in. But then she's got four to six or eight hours of the farrowing process actually going as well, too. And the thought is that these sows start to run out of gas before they actually get through some of the farrowing process. And that leads then to uh, increases in stillborns. So what we did in this study, we fed one meal a day uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning with six pounds uh, delivered to these sows. We then fed one and a half pounds four times a day, so once every six hours. And so multiple feedings at the same level as this. Uh, but then uh, the last treatment here was, was four feed deliveries of an ad libitum amount of, of feed intake right here. Uh, the first thing that we saw right here, we didn't have any influence on farrowing duration. Um, putting this in perspective uh, in relation to some of the Denmark uh, work right there, I mean, their, their farrowing durations are approaching six hours and above. So maybe we don't actually have a litter size great enough that's having an influence here. We can see some of this impact on, on the amount of feed or timing of meals uh, prior to farrowing. We also did not see any statistical difference in stillborns right here. I mean, definitely the, 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 the numbers trended the right direction to support some of what Denmark was saying, but uh, definitely no, no movement in stillborns. However, we did happen to see an increase in piglet survivability from birth until weaning right here. And so first thing that you see right here is that for whatever reason, as we increased uh, meal, uh, meal offerings to the sows, we had more pigs uh, surviving through weaning. The other thing is you look at this number is you're sitting back and saying, ah, 74 and 77 percent, that's terrible. And so what's, what's going on in this operation right here? And the reality is that uh, this farm had broke with PERS about four uh, months prior to us starting the trial. The, they still had litters locked down. They weren't cross-fostering. They weren't moving animals. And so part of the lower uh, number of, an, of pigs that actually survived is a reflection of some of the management that had to happen at that farm because of the PERS that they had, uh, that they had witnessed. But in any case, some treatment differences that might suggest uh, offering meals more frequently to animals coming in may have some benefits on survivability, in addition to having some benefits on piglet weaning weight. So offering even the same amount of feed more times than, than one specific dose started to have an increase in piglet weaning weight with the ad libitum intake at the far end uh, having the highest piglet weaning weight. <coughs> Probably a reflection of increased feed intake that we also observed with these sows right here. And so even though we had these sows in the last treatment on an ad libitum feeding structure from the time they entered in the farrowing house until they, they farrowed, it didn't have any impact on lactation feed intake. And if anything, it actually increased it right here, at least numerically. This is a really important part because there's a lot of people from a management perspective that are, are really starting to jump on board with feeding sows ad libitum from the day they farrow throughout all the lactation. The challenge is that uh, sometimes they come in and still want to limit feed them when they load them into the farrowing house. I think this is a good data set that shows that the, the risks of putting them on an ad libitum feed intake uh, strategy are, are, are quite small and actually potentially some benefits on a feed intake. The big key here, right, though, is that we can't be loading sows in the farrowing house at 108 and putting them on you know, ad libitum intake then. We can't load them earlier. And so I think there's definitely a time duration right here, two to three days prior to farrowing on an ad libitum uh, feeding situation doesn't seem to have any negative effects, at least from this trial. Pushing on then to some studies uh, that we conducted here at K-State. Uh, this is a study where we looked at titrating soybean meal levels. And, and uh, there's some, some, some information out in the industry right here that suggests that feeding too high of a soybean meal level will negatively influence feed intake. But there really wasn't a lot of data to support it. And so we went through and, and conducted this study where we fed uh, 500 or 600 or 700 pounds of soybean meal per ton uh, in lactation diets. This is the feed intake of the sow from day zero to seven, seven to 14, 14 to wean, and four to wean. And if we just look at this uh, column over here on the right, definitely as we increased soybean meal concentration of the diet, we saw a reduction in lactation feed intake. And I think this is something that we tend to see here, even tend to see it sometimes in nursery pigs. We get too much soybean meal in those diets. The pigs don't like it. The pigs don't like to eat uh, the taste of that bean meal. So being mindful that we're not uh, having more than 600 pounds of bean meal in your lactation diets is probably a good standard uh, that we should consider. We did not see any difference in litter average daily gain in this study. However, uh, the sows on that last trial, we had lowest feed intake right here, 
We also had salads that lost the most weight and they mobilized the most back fat uh, during that lactation period. And so what we see with just looking at, at one cycle, that the sow was able to compensate for her lower feed intake by mobilizing body tissues to make sure and support the growth performance of her pigs. You know, then the, the next question is what happens if you put this on a full system and you feed for multiple cycles, you know, there's a chance for other uh, further negative effects from feeding that high level of soybean meal. So keeping a calf at around 600 pounds uh, probably makes a lot of good sense when you're formulating your lactation diets. There's also a big push right now looking at antibiotic replacements uh, in, in the industry. And uh, one, one of the strategies that's been suggested to have an impact is using uh, seaweed uh, products to go and, and stimulate performance in, in the absence of antibiotics. And so in this particular study, we fed just any lactate and diets, either a diet with or without a blend of red and green uh, algae or, or a red and green seaweed. And then we took those litters and fed their offspring diets with or without uh, the, the seaweed as well too. And so carried these pigs all the way from gestation, the litters all the way until they were marketed, did not see any change in performance, whether it's through gestation or lactation or piglet performance right there. However, we did see a change in microbiota composition right here. And so what we see right here, this is the number of species within each of these different families. Typically an increase in the number of species within these two families would be considered beneficial. These, these families of, of microbiota um, are considered beneficial uh, bacteria. On the other hand, uh, Fusobacteriaceae is considered a negative or a, a, a kind of bacteria we don't want to have in there. And so a reduction in the concentration there would be considered valuable. And so I think this is something that as we continue to learn more about the microbiota, learn more about gut health, this could be a technology we want to explore further as it's, it tends to uh, influence at least a number of species in this trial in a way that would appear to be positive. Last trial that I'm gonna come up to right now is, is a wean age and antibiotic trial. Um, this is a really important trial. Um, going back, Mike, what, at 10 to 12 years with some of Roger Main's data, we were pushing out some of the wean age information. But always the question, is, is it even longer than that? Sorry, 15 years, okay, so uh, it doesn't seem like that long. But um, the, the question is always, does feed grade antibiotics um, have an interaction, does it have an influence based on uh, the, the age of the pigs when they're weaned? And so in this particular study, we fed either antibiotic-free diets or diets with antibiotics and had pigs that were weaned at 18 and a half, 21 and a half, or 24 and a half days. And so uh, the, the antibiotic diets actually had CTC in them from day eight until day 21 uh, post weaning. And so it was about a two week period there. Also at approximately seven weeks after uh, they were weaned, there was a five day period where we had CTC through the water line as they were um, batting on PERS. Uh, outbreak at that point. And so what you see right here, just put that in perspective, when we talk about the antibiotic diets, in essence it was only a 14 day period fed from day 8 to four, or eight to 21 post weaning. And so just to, to, to give you a point of reference, 18 and a half to 24 and a half pigs went from 10 and a half to, to roughly 13 and a half pound pigs. So the old rule of thumb of about a half a pound of average daily gain on lactating pigs, you know, followed through right here. This is a number of injectable antibiotics from the time that those pigs were weaned until they were uh, marketed. So we marketed all at a common age of 197 days. And so uh, a couple of things that you'll see right here from an age perspective, uh, definitely a reduction in the number of, ana of, of injectable antibiotics that were provided. And so um, no, no influence on feed grade antibiotics that influence the number of pigs that needed to be treated. But what's really important about this slide right here is that anybody that's going for an NAE type of a program, uh, the impact or the value of an increased wean age is tremendous. Okay, so the thought of only being able to have uh, less than 70% of your pigs hitting your NAE target versus something, uh, you know, just uh, darn close to, to mid-80s right there is really, really uh, important and definitely uh, a dictation of, of how profitable your system would be right there. And so if you're going NAE, push and wean age as long as you can or as old as you can probably is something you need to consider. Growth rate from weaning until 197 days of age uh, increased as we had increased weaning ages, as well as had an increase when antibiotics were present in, uh, for that two week period in the nursery phase. Removals of mortality was not influenced by, by age. However, there was a reduction uh, in the numbers of pigs that were removed or mortalities that we observed when those antibiotics were in the diet. And then if you look at the, the pounds of pork that was sold per pig that were weaned, it's a combination of increased growth rate and fewer mortalities allowed for the, the diet, or the pigs that were fed the antibiotics to have increased uh, pounds of pork uh, sold. 
as well as wean age increasing right here. And so overall, this is the big take home message from this study right here. Definitely the value of increasing wean age. I think this is why we, say, we see this trend in the industry right now of everybody pushing to, to greater wean ages. And so um, with that, I'm going to hand the, the mic over to Bob. You, you want me to talk this slide? Okay. So uh, before I hand the mic over to Bob, I'll, I'll cover this one then as well too. Um, yeah, I mean, so here, here's a slide that, that, that's pretty easy to, to, to review right here. It does a good job of showing uh, the quality of the students that we have in our program right here. And so um, actually what I'd like right now with all the graduate students, everybody in the graduate programs, us, grain science, poultry, whoever right here, could you all stand just for a minute? We'll recognize. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Enough. Very, very talented group of individuals right here, and it's someone that we're really, really proud to work with these group. I do want to, uh, to, to um, highlight one person right here, Jordan Gephardt. I realized when we put this, this list of achievements together, we, we forgot a really important one for Jordan. And so Jordan's going to uh, defend his PhD here in December, which is a really great feat uh, to begin with. But what's really impressive is that if you realize that in May last year, he finished his DVM degree at the same time of getting his PhD, it's a phenomenal uh, accomplishment for Jordan and really is a testament to the quality of the individual that Jordan has right here and uh, we've been really fortunate to have him in our program right here and so great group of students that we have right now. Uh, we can't talk enough about what they do but what I really like also is when you start looking at the, the previous students, um, this list right here is the last four or five years of where our students uh, have gone into the industry after they finished their degrees and you can look at it, I mean there, there's feed companies, there's genetic companies, technology companies. Uh, production systems. I mean, just looking at that list right there and the amount of impact that our students have on the industry is tremendous. And so, you know, it, it, it's really humbling that a lot of the students that are up here represented are also sitting in the, the audience right here today. And so, it's great that they also come back and continue to support the program.